you uh, you came here tonight to find someone who can tell you stories about the old upcountry here in New France. You've, you've come to the right place and you found exactly the right person. Really? I am uh, Sieur Charles-Michel de Langlade. To the French, to the English, I am Charles Langlade. To my Ottawa brethren, I am Akawinge Katoso, which means he who fights for his country. I've also been dubbed um, the bravest of the brave. I am sometimes called the greatest warrior in the Northwest. <laughs> Some of you are uh, wondering how someone that looks like you, Long Lad, could be the greatest warrior in the Northwest. Well, you, you have to understand that time and perhaps a bit too much pork pie have taken a toll on, uh, on me. <laughs> I um, uh, I set I set a goal very early in life to to be a, a great fighter. Um, at one point, I wanted to be an officer in the French army, um, but I quickly realized that uh, there were there were certain things that that I would have to overcome. One big one, uh, I would have to overcome a disadvantage and turn it into an advantage in order to achieve anything. And that uh, advantage was something very simple, seemingly, was my birth. My birth. I, uh, <clears throat> my birth was a disadvantage. And the reason, the, the, the way that worked was this. Um, I was born in 1729 at the Straits of Mackinac, up at the, the community of Michelin Mackinac, French community by the fort up there. And my father was a lesser French nobleman uh, who had a permit with the French crown to trade with the native people in the interior. He was a bourgeois, that is a businessman who financed trade expeditions into the interior with trade goods to trade for furs and then bring them back to be shipped to Montreal and eventually to France. Um, That would be a that would be a problem for me. Had uh, well, what happened was this: he it was customary, almost customary, but very very frequently the case that French fur traders took native wives. They married Indian women, and um, what this did was for the trader it uh, it uh, uh, drew links between. Uh, relative trade links between relatives within the family, uh, families within the band, bands within the tribe, and then sometimes trade links even beyond that. So from the standpoint of a fur trader, this was good business. Now, now don't get the idea there was no, no, no love, no romance, no devotion between my mother and father because that wasn't, that wasn't the case. But what it did mean was that um, upon my birth, I would be called Métis. That's not a name, it's a term. And uh, here in New France, it was a, you could consider it to be a polite term for someone of mixed blood, or less politely, a half-breed, all right? It, uh, among my, my father's relatives and his friends in the French nobility, it, it basically meant that I, upon my birth, was the result of my father's indiscretion with an Indian woman. I, at best, at worst, I was his bastard son. Uh, now this is, a, this is a disadvantage for a male, because in the French system, title, rank, wealth, all these things are handed down from father to son. But there's a, there's, there's a specification it has to be a legitimate son. So I would receive none of those things from him. So I was going to have to make my fortune in a, in a different way. Well, it was my mother's side of the family that would come to the rescue. and They would change my fortune. 
My mother was the sister of a prominent Ottawa war chief. My uncle then was a prominent Ottawa war chief. The relationship between an uncle and a nephew in the Ottawa system could be as strong as that between father and son. An uncle taught you all sorts of things and his craft was war. And so he began an education, he began my education that was going to lead me down a path to becoming a great warrior. It started, I remember it started when I was 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, my uncle had a dream. Now dreams are messages from the spirit world and uh, they have to be acted upon, good or bad. And in this dream, he was told that a raid that was being planned by my people, the Ottawas, against our enemies in the Tennessee country could only succeed if I, Charles de Langlade, was present as part of it. Well, 10 years old, my father didn't really like that idea. He thought it was a pretty dangerous thing for a 10-year-old boy. But uh, he eventually relented and he said, go with your uncle, but I never ever want to hear anything about your conduct related to a lack of courage on your part. Well, I went along. I, um, the, the battle was a great victory. And so was the next one when I went along and the next one when I went along and eventually I started to engage in the actual fighting. And I, I, my uncle could see that my war power was strong and that I was on the, on the, the route, on the, on the path to becoming a, a really great fighter. Now this wasn't lost on my father. Um, I wanted to be an officer in the French army, but it wasn't going to happen. And the reason for that, what do you suppose? I wasn't white, I was a Métis. And the only, the, only, the only thing he could do, and he did, is he secured me a cadetship in the French Marine. Now in the French Marine, your father didn't buy your commission, uh, he didn't buy your rank. Um, in the French Marine, you went higher in rank and gained position based on merit. And that's the same way it was among Ottawa warriors. Your, your claim to fame was based on what you on what you did, on what you accomplished. So, here, here was an opportunity uh, for the, the disadvantage to become an advantage. Because my schooling in the French Marines meant that I could fight according to the European system. And what my uncle had been teaching me and the battles I had fought as an Ottawa warrior made it possible for me to fight in the Indian style. And the combination of those two was going to be an advantage to me throughout my military career. Um, you'll have to excuse me, the memories don't flow as, as easily as they, uh, as they used to. Um, by 1752, the French were having a problem in the Ohio River Valley. British traders were coming in and sneaking into villages and wooing the, wooing the tribe over with cheap trade goods. They have cheap trade goods, you've got to start trading with us instead of those awful Frenchmen. And um, the loyalties of those bands and those villages was weakening. And the French authorities, in their typical fashion, didn't know what to do, they didn't quite know how to face this. They could see it was not good, that it was going to be a, a, a definite uh, detriment. Um, and I was tired. I and, and my Ottawa warriors were tired of watching them argue and vacillate, so we took matters into our own hands. We, um, we engaged a war party, and we went to the village of Pickawillany, which was the seat of disloyalty in the Ohio Valley. And we destroyed it. And uh, you're looking at you're looking at the man that started the French and Indian War. 
because because that attack did two things. It warned all of the tribes of the region that you'd better stay loyal to the French or else. Um, but it so inflamed the rivalry between the French and the English that within two years, by 1754, we'd have a full-fledged war that became known as the French and Indian War. So I, I started the French and Indian War. Now, I, uh, I have a tendency to brag. Uh, you, <laughs> I boast a bit. I think, it's the, uh, I think it's the Ottawa blood in me that wells up once in a while and causes me to speak that way. Um, I fought with distinction uh, throughout the French and Indian War. My, my greatest talent was this, and it's related to this advantage that I had. I could take Indian warriors and convince them to fight as an organized unit. Now, to white people, that, that doesn't make any sense. That's the way you do it. You send a unit into battle, and they fight for the same goals and objectives. Not so with Indian warriors. You go to war when you feel like it. You leave the field of battle when you feel that it's time or you're going to lose. Um, you are there. Indeed, you're fighting to defend your country, but you're really there to test your war power against that of the enemy. Um, but I, because I spoke the languages of so many tribes, because I was Ottawa myself, uh, pe people trusted me. And as a result, I was able to train warriors to fight as a cohesive unit. And uh, we gained some, some particular status, at least for a short time, uh, in the Battle of Quebec. In 1759, the French were trying to hold on to the city of Quebec against a siege by, by British forces. And we, we fought on what came to be known as the Plains of Abraham. Uh -huh. And uh, I and my Indian allies, um, we surrounded a sizable force of British soldiers. And I sent for, for assistance, I sent for help uh, to secure them, to, to capture them. But again, the, the arguing and, and, and the, the slow response from the French command caused us to lose the opportunity. We, we, we lost the advantage, and ultimately we would lose the battle. But uh, on the battlefield that day, Charles de Langlade gained special prominence once again. He became known as the bravest of the brave. Am I boasting? <laughs> um, this is what happened. Someone after the battle said that they had seen Langlade exhibit coolness under fire and courage like they had never seen before. And uh, what, what happened was I, uh, at one point in the heat of the battle, I laid down my musket, I took out my pipe, I filled it, I struck a light, and I smoked a pipe with the battle raging all around me. Coolness under fire, the bravest of the brave. At Langlad, he said, such courage. No, no, the, my, my musket was so hot from being fired repeatedly, I couldn't touch the barrel to load it. So I laid it down to cool, and not wanting to waste time, I got out my pipe and decided, why not have a good smoke? <laughs> so I became the bravest of the brave. Um, in 1760, I, um, I achieved another goal in my life, and that was, as a, as a military man, I wanted to eventually get the command of a fort. And what was happening by 1759-60 is British forces were being pushed to the west, and ahead of them, French forts were being surrendered, and the garrisons and command in those forts was heading to the Mississippi and going down to French territory in New Orleans to be shipped back to France. Well, I got the command of French, the French fort at Michelomackinac. It was the farthest west, last French garrison at that particular time. And it was given one special duty, uh, which
wish it had been better than this, but it was my duty to surrender the fort. That was all, that was what I had to do. Properly, formally surrender the fort to the British. Well, um, took a long time for the British to get there, but I surrendered the fort and I um, joined the British Army. And I swore allegiance to the, to the new flag, the British flag. Um, now, there are, there are people that uh, didn't like that. They, they, thought I was, uh, they thought I was a turncoat. You know, I had fought with the French against the British. Eventually, I would fight with the British against the colonial forces. And uh, what they didn't realize is that I was fighting for something else. And that was, I was fighting for the good of my people. I reasoned that if I were sent back to France, or sent to France, I'd never been there, wasn't born there, didn't know French culture. I was a child of the of Le Bay here. Um, for a Métis, there would be no, no life in France for a mixed blood. So um, it was my idea that I stay here, um, pledge allegiance to the new flag, get the best deal I possibly could for my people. Because by the time we get to 1763, it is the tribes of the region are learning that it's futile to fight the to fight the British, to fight the Europeans. Um, during the the uh, rebellion of the colonies against the British government, I was sent from Mackinac East to participate in the fighting, and I I fought some battles there. The last one was farther to the west. I participated in the battle for St. Louis. But then after that, I was called back to Michelamackinac and Le Bay. And the reason for that was I was given the position of Indian agent. And this was, again, related to that advantage-disadvantage. Because the people trusted me, because I spoke the language, because I was of the culture of this region, I had particularly strong influence with them. And even though after the the fight with the colonies, this became American soil on the map. The Americans never, in the course of my lifetime, they never really made it here. They had very, very 